Hello and welcome back to the Property and Lending Show. Uh, joined with me as always, Peter Georgie, Head of Asset Finance, Ferdy Youssef, uh, uh, Head of Everything at Power Loans and Mark Collada, who has decided, I'm so excited, I'm so excited for this week because Mark Collada has decided he's going to bring a personality to the show. <laughs> so we're going to go straight to Mark. Mark, how you been? How's your week? Tell us about how you feel. Big week as normal. Um, every week's a big week here at Power Loan, so always exciting. Uh, feeling amazing. Back at the gym, uh, not that anyone realised, so that's obviously paying off and worth the time. Um, property is going well um, and clients all moving forward. Can't complain. That's amazing. I'm not going to push it because we've got to baby step you into this personality thing. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, today we're going to discuss something that a lot of people will ask us, I guess, um, regarding strategies, um, strategies, exit strategies, investing strategies, just strategies in general. And there are so many strategies, actually. Um, so, so many strategies that and, and sub strategies. But we've we've really we're going to focus on four today. Um, uh, and they are, I guess, buy and hold flips, uh, flipping properties, developments, and buy and hold with with a sale at the end. Um, so I think a couple of us are going to discuss um, a strategy or two, and then we'll see if uh, if there's any questions that come up, and hopefully it'll um, help our our listeners figure out their strategy. Let's speak about, I guess, we'll, we'll go straight into uh, maybe development, um, development subdivision, things like that. Um, we'll let Ferdy uh, hit this one, and then um, we'll go from there. So I'm I'm hitting the subdivision point. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Oh, that's all right. Now, so in regards to um, purchasing property and subdividing a building a duplex, in some scenarios, you can find customers that are looking to purchase and build uh, free duplexes or terrace homes that we call them uh, these days. Um, in regards to the subdivision, most lenders were allowed to build up to three dwellings on the one title and they're on subdividing it. But once we move from above three securities on the one title, that's where it becomes more of a commercial product. And then lenders would need that subdivision to be done with council and within the lender prior to construction. So just recently we had a scenario like this where a customer is building two lots of duplexes on the one land. Before he, before he could start the second lot of duplexes, which will go up to four uh, securities, he had to subdivide it, get the bank's mission first to subdivide it, then it goes to council. So that's in regards to starting the construction, but up to three homes or three securities on the one title can still be done as a normal residential construction loan. But once we hit above the three terrace or duplexes on the one, uh, one title, that's when we're looking more for commercial or the smarter move and the cheaper move, we'll be looking at subdividing that land prior to construction. Have I covered that or is there other questions? Yeah. I was going to, I guess, uh, to start off with, um, what kind of strategy is, is this for someone? Is this, you know, would you typically see, you know, first timers going down this route? Is this for more experienced investors? Um, you know, what kind of people are, are using this strategy to, to invest? Um, so there's a few scenarios so when people or when clients come and approach us. So look at scenario number one where it's like maybe a mummy and daddy project. They purchase land, an old house on um, a huge uh, land. They knock it down and build a duplex. They live in one property themselves and they rent out the other property. Have I said something wrong? <laughs> Sorry, mummy and daddy really got me. <laughs> the mummy and daddy projects, yeah. So people that are pretty much purchasing the property and building it themselves or getting a builder along to build it themselves and then managing it saves a lot of costs um, as well. Um, but in regards to like holding, to sub subdividing that land, they wouldn't have to look at doing that because they're going to be living in one of the securities and renting the other security out. When you're coming to sell those properties, if you're looking to purchase, build a duplex, stay in one, sell the other one or sell both of them, you're better off subdividing both of them so you can sell each security, security separately, obviously, and obviously it brings up the value of each property up instead of just selling it as the whole one unit. And you're not going to be able to sell as one unit, both of them, unless they're subdivided anyway. Um, in regards to building and selling, 
You can do that at the end of construction. It's not something you need to be doing at the at the beginning. If you're building a duplex or up to three, you don't have to subdivide the properties at the beginning. You can do that all after construction as well. So there's a few rules around it. All comes down to the scenario that you know the customers are looking for. So yeah. Yeah. Do you do you find that this is a higher risk? investment or is it quite a low risk investment um you know I, I obviously we don't recommend or or anything like that on this program but uh, as a first time investor is this something that someone should look at or or not really um man we've seen a lot of scenarios where you know we've had the first time investors and we've had like seasonal investors that have done these sort of projects and we're seeing a lot of them recently as well especially living in sydney if we look at I guess Padsto a couple of years ago, Padsto didn't look the way it did these days as well where a duplex is coming up. And you're finding people uh, getting into these projects mainly, they're doing obviously their homework, they've picked the builder, they've tried to go, you know, get through council. Like it's a, it's a long process. It can take up to, you know, from what we understand, 12 to 18 months. It just depends on how it's going to go through council and get that all approved. Um, I couldn't tell you, I mean, if you can take the headache, like obviously building is no walk in the park as well. And, you know, we hear stories from customers, but some of them are like the headache's worth it. But it really comes down to what First Brig recommends, if it's going to be working out better for them or not. Uh, Peter, Mark, any questions regarding that? I oh, was just going to add, so um, it's definitely for the active investment in, investor, especially nowadays with construction costs moving quickly, labor costs um, moving quickly as well. It's it's a it's a process where um, the price is very great, especially at the beginning in 18 months time, let alone in three months time, who knows how much the same tiles that you're buying today are going to be worth. So definitely for the active investor, definitely for someone that has a cash buffer, we always, I always tell um customers doing construction you don't have a cash buffer yet, and then you need funds towards the end of the build and the market shifted and come down it's going to be difficult to get there. so definitely need a cash buffer to make sure they can complete the project um and one more point about that as well is once a bank's name is on your title because they're moving the property and you're mid construction you cannot move that to another lender so midway and you can't get any more money from the bank. You're there is no other. You need to have a cash buffer there. There are private lenders that go on a second mortgage, but that gets messy and very expensive. And keep in regards to going for these sort of, uh, yeah, am I muted? No. <laughs> now, so I was just about to say, so keep in mind, it, uh, there's different products and different lenders for certain people coming through. So, for example, for a builder that's coming through, he's looking to basically, he's got experience in building, he's looking to purchase, build and sell. They would usually go down more of a, you know, development kind of loan where they're just purchasing the projects, they do the numbers and see if there's going to be a profit on that project as well of a minimum 15% with most lenders. They'll allow them to do that project as long as we can present them with those numbers to do that. Again, to the mummy and daddy investors, basically people that are purchasing these properties and building them themselves and renting it out or selling it as well. They have the option of going through the residential route in regards to purchasing that property and using rental income. So that's another thing as well. You're able to use future rental income, proposed rental income from when the securities are complete. You're able to use that rental income towards your servicing as well, which obviously helps out a lot. And keep in mind, I think one of the questions that are always coming up in regards to subdivisions or purchasing a property and building a, a, a duplex on it as well is the LVR. So they're worried, customers are worried when they purchase the land, are they going to have to put another deposit towards the construction later on? We like to think, and from what we've seen so far, the scenario, the answer to that scenario is no, because when you're purchasing a property, whether you're purchasing a 10% deposit, 20% deposit, they're going to value that final build on the finished product. So you're hoping in any, in any case, any reason why you're going into this project is the project's going to be worth a lot more um, than what your loan's going to be anyway. And you're hoping to be under the 80%, which we find in most scenarios. So they're valuing it on the finished product and they're using the finished product's rental income. I'd just like to add, um, it was a good point, Mark said, uh, this is an active investment, not a passive investment. So you, you definitely will be hands-on. Um, something that I do notice a lot with development 
um, projects or, or clients, especially, you know, your mom and dad investors or mom and dad developers, um, is that they actually don't take into account all the costs. And I was discussing this with Peter actually today, uh, where people don't take into account all the costs involved. A lot of people will look at a, say, a block of land, uh, say it's a million dollars, um, and then uh, construction costs on a duplex, for example, could be, say, 1.2 million. So it's 2.2, and they'll think, okay, if I sell it for 1.3 each, that's 2.6, we've made 200 grand profit. Um, it's really not the scenario because you actually haven't taken into account stamp duty. You haven't taken into account um, your holding costs, so interest that you're paying over the time that it takes to build. And obviously, you're not receiving any rental income during that period as well. So it is costing you money there as well, which you have to take into account. And then obviously, uh, builder's fees. Um, but again, the other thing is you have to sell the properties to actually profit in most of the scenarios some people will hold but in this scenario i guess we're talking about a sale um so you got to take into account agent fees so after you've taken all of that out and then there's also capital gains tax um you're often not left with too much especially if you're not the builder yourself um if you are a builder it's a bit different because you're obviously getting cost price on a lot of on on materials you don't have to pay a builder because you're doing it yourself so it's a bit different but for mom and dad investors or mom and dad developers they don't take into account a lot of these costs the final cost as well that people don't take into account, which is very important, I think, is usually people who do this want to do it again. And if you're going to do it again, you have to take into account your re-entry costs. So again, stem duty to buy into something else. Um, so after you've taken into account your initial stem duty, your agent fees, your holding costs, capital gains tax, that potential 200 grand you think you've made might actually become 30 grand or 40 grand. And then when you buy something else, you've got to buy, pay stem duty again which actually might be that more than that 30, 40 grand if you're talking about a million dollar block of land, you actually end the negative. Um, so people don't really take into account all the costs. And I, I just wanted to add, uh, put that point that it is very important to to take into account all costs, um, especially for mom and dad developers. Um, I was just going to add one more thing. So <clears throat> Fede was mentioning before that um, sometimes like it, it is a very common question um, where you put a deposit down 10, 20, 15%, whatever you can do. Uh, for the initial land and then when you come to do the build a common question is how much do i need to contribute again given that they want to contribute the minimum if you're not subdividing the land yeah the valuation is probably going to be okay um and they do it based on the completed value based on the architectural um the floor plans and all the uh, the renders and everything like that um but when you're going to subdivide the banks vast majority of the banks all the major banks do this thing called a one line valuation which is where they value the property despite it going to be subdivided in the future because it's not subdivided now they value the duplex that you're building for example as if it's going to be sold to one person on one contract and it's going to stay on one title what that leads to is a lower um, completed value than expected and the way that hinders um, the borrowing is because the maximum lvr or the maximum lending against the property value that you can do has now uh, minimized because the property value is lower than expected. And that's really, unfortunately, not something we find out until after you get the DA approval and all the, the tech drawings, the architectural uh, drawings and the building contract and everything. After you go through all of that, that's when we find out the valuation, uh, which is a bit frustrating, but it is something that comes up. Question? Um, does it make a difference loan wise if the um, if the person who's uh, purchasing land and building does it make a difference if they're the developer loan wise? Yeah, so um, if you're a builder and you're going to do your own project from the bank's point of view, your business, which is you know you've made your money building for other people, most of your resources now from the bank's point of view is going to be spent on your project so your income which is coming from your business for example is probably going to dry up so what the banks do is they put a maximum lvr which is going to be lower for um uh, builders that are going to do their own property um they're called owner builders those are the types of loans that we're talking about now um there are banks that we go to specifically in this scenario and that's why it's important to go to a broker with like we have 40 plus banks for that reason we have a bank perfect for everyone's scenario so we have builders that we have banks sorry that love builders and that's primarily their demographic so in a situation like that we would go to that bank they are a little bit more pricey but they do let you borrow with a much higher lvr than if you just went to one of the big four And keep in mind as well, in that scenario, that question that Pete was asking, 
if you're looking to start a project like this, and we've got a lot of first time investors in these sort of projects, there are lenders out of you know the top four, you know, the second or third tier lenders will allow you to do these sort of projects as long as we provide you know the products, uh, sorry, documentation that I request for as well. So if you're not able to go through those lenders, like Mark said, we've got over 40 lenders that's going to find us, uh, you know, a result for you, basically, yeah. Cool. I think I think that's a good wrap on developments and subdivision. Uh, there's definitely um, risks involved, and it is it is more of an active investment rather than a passive. So if you are considering, definitely speak to your brokers, uh, speak to mortgage, uh, speak speak to power loans and really really crunch the numbers properly um, before you you know jump into something because whilst it can be very very lucrative uh, if you haven't run the numbers properly uh, it can actually cost you money rather than make you money and we might segue into a similar topic a uh, similar strategy um, regarding renovations and flipping so I'll let uh, I'll let Mark take the lead on this one um, so with this um, strategy, it's really common you hear pre uh, people talking about manufacturing growth. So the way that happens uh, a lot of the time, and I particularly don't mind this strategy. Again, it is more active than buying a property and just letting it grow over 30 years and eventually paying down the debt till it's zero and you're retired. Um, definitely more active than that, but less active than the development purchase. So with a property like this, ideally you're looking for um, a, a property in an area that's undervalued there might be the ugly duckling it'll be the it'll be the property that doesn't look the nicest to look at but it's on very valuable land it's a good size good floor plan and there's no major structural changes that need to happen for the property we're talking just small things so you might need to redo the cabinetry in the um the kitchen you might need to redo the bathroom the tiles the flooring the lighting that's about it uh, and a bit of landscaping if that's the sort of thing that you're um, keen to do, which is obviously more passive, more active than buying just the property and holding it, um, there is great potential because if you do buy the right property at the right price um, and do this renovation, uh, which again, is not gonna be uh, that big out of pocket compared to knocking down a rebuilding, of course, um, it could work out very lucrative, but definitely is more active uh, than your normal buy and hold um, purchases that we see so common, but great potential here to manufacture growth. Um, the only other thing I was going to say as well is the other way that people uh, manufacture growth on their property that I can think of um, is that sometimes they'll add a granny flat at the back that will need a construction loan because you're you know, um, adding a whole new structure. But that is another way you can um, manufacture that growth. You're going to increase your rental yield um, instantly because the total rental on the property will go up um, as well as obviously the total funds um, into the property because now you've um, not only bought the property but built a granny flat as well so those are the two ways yeah regarding lending on a renovation project um, are you informing the bank prior to a purchase that you're looking at doing a flip or is it more so you just get the loan to purchase the property and then you know you're spending your own cash owner's equity on on the renovation how does that work yeah i literally just got this question two days ago um so unless you're doing structural changes to the um to the actual house or the whatever you're buying uh, we don't need to do a construction loan with a construction loan they'll do a few valuation based on the completed value based on the da approval and the value and the drawings and everything that we said if you're just doing cosmetic renovations um, a lot of the time you do it out of pocket um, unless you're going to hold the property wait for it to grow and then extract that equity with the purposes of renovation which is fine but there needs to be equity there to be able to take out so if you buy a property today um, for a million dollars and you're putting down let's say 20 percent deposit and you're non you're not a medico or accountant lawyer or any of the um special um occupations that have the lmi waivers up to 90 percent um you can take out up to 80 percent of the property value if you've only put a 20 percent deposit down you're already at the threshold so you're going to need to wait till um the property grows in value so you can take out more or if you have the cash to do the um, project yourself that can also happen um, these tend not to be too expensive as well like if it depends obviously on how much you're doing but this will i have a customer that took out 50 grand to redo his bathrooms for example so you might have um, that sitting in your account and you would put it into your figures as well so that you're not using all your cash on the purchase and then figure out that you get stuck later on so Definitely something to bring up with your broker at the time of the pre-approval initially so you understand, can I actually complete this? 
with with renovations i know because <clears throat> we do we do help clients on our end as well find properties to renovate i think a very important point in terms of building that strategy and ensuring you you get the right property um <clears throat> is finding you you have to understand the suburb profile as well um there's a very there's a term uh called overcapitalization or overcapitalizing and it's very common that people will purchase a property um in a location and then do this extensive renovation and you know the property looks immaculate it's the most beautiful thing you ever see um but the location doesn't warrant a property at that quality or the the quality of finishes for example and that property may have gone from you know evaluation of one to 1.5 in any other location um, and you spend 400 grand on a renovation but in the location you've purchased in because it doesn't warrant a property at that level um, you actually can't sell it for that price so i think very important with renovations and flipping is you have to actually it's very important to get the location right and like mark said you really buying the ugliest duckling on that street and bringing it up to standard for that street you don't necessarily have to make it the most beautiful thing you just have to make it in line with that suburb and um, so often it's it's more about picking a really under market value property um, that needs some work and you're bringing it to level because i've seen it countless times where people do overcapitalize um, and they'll spend 200 grand on a renovation but because of the location they've purchased in or the initial purchase price they can actually only resell it for an extra 100 grand or 150 and again you've lost money so similar to development um when you're doing these active investments, it's very important to take into account a lot of factors and ensure you do your numbers properly. Typically, bathrooms, kitchens get you the biggest return on investment um, and a paint. And then other little things are kind of just to clean up. But really, you're looking for a three to one um, return on investment to to keep a safe buffer as well. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have any other points regarding that. Um. Just in regards to the flipping, in regards to lending, so are we discussing where a customer comes through, purchases, <clears throat> property that are run down like you guys are discussing, renovate them and sell them, and sell them within how many months, how many years? Because, again, if we go back to discuss fees and costs involved, this is something that has to be taken into account in regards to capital, capital gain tax. If they're purchasing an investment and selling within the year, I, I, I can't even imagine what the capital gain tax will be on that as well. Is the renovation going to be worth doing and it's going to take into account that amount as well or is it better to purchase these properties like you said renovate the kitchens bathrooms give it a pain and rent them at a higher price well i guess that's maybe another strategy yeah i guess i mean similar to the developments you have to take into account all costs involved um and if you are looking at flipping so selling you have to take into account your capital gains tax, your exit costs, and then re-entry costs because the idea is, again, to do another one and another one. Um, so you have to take into account all these costs. Obviously, if you hold the property for 12 months, um, there is CGT exemptions applicable um, in cases. So you really do have to take into account. And if you are planning on holding 12 months, then you have to add, add, take into account, okay, well, if the renovation only took three months, what are we doing for the next nine months? Are we renting it out? That income is now taxable. Um, so there is a lot of, a lot of uh, consideration, um, but again, can be very lucrative. Um, but you just, yeah. it's very important not to overcapitalize and really put, really run the numbers and, and find comparable sales to ensure that you're running these numbers properly. If, if there's no other questions or, or points on that, we'll move on to the last two strategies, uh, which are very similar. Um, the only difference is, is right at the end. Um, and this is a buy and hold strategy, which is um, a passive strategy. So buy and hold um, is probably the most common strategy um, in, in investing in real estate in Australia. And in a, in a nutshell, you're buying properties and you're holding them. Um, then, you know, your, your loan term is usually 30 years. And by the end of that 30 years, you've paid off the debt and you have passive income via the rent coming through that property. Now, the idea is you accumulate a couple of properties. You can use equity or cash to continue to purchase uh, more properties. Obviously, you need to be able to service. And, and this is a very big part of what we do. Is we That's why we always tell our clients to use power loans because you guys actually run serviceability 
on future potential purchases so we can actually build a strategy and we say okay if we purchase this property at x amount and it rents for this much in five years time in three years time can we purchase another one um and you know i always get you guys to do those numbers and and that's how we can ensure that we don't run into serviceability issues and that's why cash flow is such a consideration these days but the idea is you're just accumulating properties um you're holding them you're not selling um and you're increasing your net assets your net worth and then you get to a point where you've either sold all the properties uh, sorry you you've paid off all your debt um and then you're just leaving rent uh you're leaving debt free and you're receiving the rent and that becomes your income so if you had <clears throat> for example two and a half million dollars in paid off assets um, which could be five properties at 500 grand four properties at a little bit more um on a typical five percent yield that would be a hundred thousand dollars after maintenance and, and property management fees and whatnot passive income where well, you're not doing anything you're not working and every year you're receiving an income of a hundred thousand dollars that is i guess the most common scenario that people look to achieve there is another um, side to this as well where people do buy and hold where they don't sell but uh, and it's a little bit more risky um or it's a bit more aggressive where they live off equity and how they do that is they have a portfolio of say again two and a half million dollars um and then if the property goes up if the of the total um portfolio goes up um say five percent that's 125 grand a year and they actually extract that equity and live off the equity the obvious problem with this is that you're increasing your debt again with no real methods of paying it off because at this point you're essentially probably retired um so but people do do this it is not uncommon but these people usually have quite big cash reserves and whatnot in offset accounts to to you know negate the interest that you're being that you're paying the other <clears throat> scenario which is the buy and hold of and sell a couple properties is essentially the exact same thing where you've purchased quite a few properties or four or five properties it doesn't need to be you know 10 properties you you know usually three to five properties is enough you've held them for quite a long time you might have actually purchased one extra property with the purpose of selling that property later and then in 10 15 20 years one of the properties that has the most amount of capital gains um is then sold and then you, the the profits from that sale is used to pay off the debt on the other properties and then essentially it's the same scenario where you're holding on to these properties and just receiving the rent um it is the most passive um way to invest it is the most common um there's a lot less headache involved with the, you know in comparison to development and renovations but of course as well it is the slowest with developments um, renovations subdivisions it's active so you you are manufacturing growth or you you are manufacturing um profit by you know doing work and this is more so it's something in the background you don't think about it you just let time do its thing increase the value of the property buying in the right locations getting the right tenants even you know letting time do its thing those are the most common strategies they have their benefits and they also have their cons like anything else um usually first-time investors will start with this and then as they build their portfolio they may venture into developments or may venture into renovations but they usually have some sort of asset base um this strategy also works with commercial properties so it doesn't have to be a strict resi portfolio it can be a mix of resi and commercial um but in a nutshell you're buying properties you're holding them and then paying them down either through your 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 salary your income um, paying down debt over time or selling a property or two at the end of, or after 20 years where there's quite a lot of growth and using those funds to pay down the debt is there any questions regarding that strategy man um <clears throat> i'm actually i love the strategy that you, you were discussing at the end there in regards to purchasing 10 properties and hopefully one of those properties that you're purchasing can be sold later on i think it's it's great to highlight as well it's more of a long-term game like you said it's all about time but I'm guessing, obviously, we're not accountants, but I'm guessing as well at the same time, they're benefiting through tax benefits as well. Having, you know, that buffer against their normal income, their PAYG, they're saving them tax benefits uh, there as well. In regards, are you seeing a lot of customers as well purchasing under their super, under their personal names, under a trust, a unit trust as well? So I'm guessing if you have the right account, you see the right account, can also save you costs through those sort of setups as well, those sort of structures. But what have you been saying in regards to that? purchasing customers purchasing yeah i think typically um typically people do purchase their first investment property in their own name um 
whether that's lack of knowledge or it's just it is just to be honest it is the easiest and cheapest way to purchase property um obviously once you start buying in trusts and whatnot there are other costs involved so it can become pricey so usually people don't do that on their first property um not it's right or wrong it's just uh, you know what people usually do um but we do see people purchasing in trusts um usually as well for serviceability um to to help with serviceability which you guys will be able to talk about a lot more than i can um but yeah super is definitely something smsfs are something that is coming through a lot recently uh where people have money in their super and they may not be able to service under their own name or their trusts or whatnot or may not have the deposits involved uh, or required for purchasing in their own name but they've got this you know rather large amount of funds in their super just sitting there which they can't touch anyway and so they decide hey let's invest in property because we can't touch it and because it's a passive investment um and it's a long-term thing well we might as well invest it in real estate and then let time do its thing again we can't touch it till we retire so we that we we are seeing a lot of people purchase in their smsfs um uh for for this strategy a buy and hold strategy which obviously once the their age requirements um are met then they can you know take control and do what they want with it as well and uh so keep in mind as well yeah like you discussed before also under the smsf you can purchase commercial property whether it's an investment commercial property and the biggest kicker here you can also purchase under the smsf a commercial property that's owner occupied so it's, you know for example, you can be running your business out of that commercial site as well that you can be using your SMSF to purchase through as well. So I think SMSF, like, like you said, we've been seeing a lot of people coming through and utilizing that tool. Something that I learned personally through, through our customers as well in regards to how they're purchasing under the trust, how they, you know, it's basically a long-term game like we discussed before. Yeah, and if anyone does is, in, is curious about their SMSF and how they can purchase through it or... Or any questions like that reach out to any of us um and, and we'll be able to direct you you know to a top financial planner that can assist with smsfs um and, and guide you with that as well um was there any questions or comments though regarding the buy and hold strategies nope i'm very good at explaining things so uh <laughs> um i don't if there's nothing else to add it's a pretty good episode very very direct to the point i think we covered a lot um peter's got to go so we're, we're going to cut this one short uh or on good time um but as always thank you so much to everyone that listens and tunes in i think next week we are planning to have an a dedicated asset finance episode so if you do have asset finance questions send them into peter mark fairly myself um comment on our instagram pages or wherever just email us let us know and we'll ensure that peter gets grilled next week and um and has all the answers for you but if there's nothing else to add, thank you as always and stay tuned for next time. Cheers.